Reverend Fathers, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's my distinct honor to welcome you to this keynote address of the 2024 Colloquium on Liturgical Music in Eastern Orthodox Theological Education. Um, this colloquium is part of a larger project uh, funded uh, by a grant from the Vital Worship, Vital Preaching uh, grant program of the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship of Grand Rapids, Michigan, with funds provided by the Lilly Endowment. Um, today, thus far in the colloquium, we have had uh, a student panel and uh, presentations uh, by uh, a visiting scholar and much discussion on the subject of liturgical music in, in higher education. And for our keynote address, it is just absolutely wonderful to welcome back to the campus here of St. Vladimir's Seminary, our Professor Emeritus and former Dean, the Rever very Reverend Dr. John Erickson. Um, he has a, a very long and distinguished page on our website of the um, uh, of the seminary, uh, mentioning that he is Peter N. Gramovich, Professor of Church History Emeritus, and also Dean of this seminary from 2002 to 2007, uh, with undergraduate degree from Harvard College, an MPhil from Yale, an MTH from St. Vladimir's, uh, and then also an honorary doctorate from this same institution. Um, a, a a super impressive list of publications and of uh, items uh, of church and professional activities testifying to his long service to the Orthodox Church and to the scholarly community at large. Uh, but one thing that's tucked in there up at the top under books, uh, which perhaps not everyone is so aware of, uh, is co-editor of five volumes of Orthodox Liturgical Music, SBS Press. Uh, so one of the reasons that we invited Father John to give the keynote address for this talk uh, is precisely because of his sort of quiet, determined, cheerful work behind the scenes and in the choir for many years, uh, long before his ordination. Uh, and so, uh, I myself m met him when I came as a student in 1990 to this institution, and uh, he and his wife Helen were among the people that made me feel so very welcome here at, at St. Vladimir's, and we would have all these wonderful chats on the sidelines of things, and I have a very strong memory of, I think, just the the day before I left at the end of term, um, then going up to to the house, which now has been uh, paved over and rebuilt by other things, uh, but of, of um, to their to their house uh, for a, a chat in their living room, uh, wide ranging as things always were, but this one especially. So it's a, a memory I I have treasured uh, since then. And then I don't know it. Something about building these relationships kept bringing me back here. <laughs> over the years and um i i was deeply honored when i was by uh him when he was dean to be invited to give the schmeman lecture here in 2004 so now strangely i find myself on the other side of the the podium in the part of doing introductions uh to introduce him uh as he is going to give us a talk this evening uh on stories from the last century which is when we got to know each other so, um, uh, Father John. I hope I'll be able to hold these notes and little messages I've scribbled to myself together and also the papers, the pages I'm supposed to look at and what will be a very limited number of illustrations for these, I apologize. I'll explain along the way. I had uh, several things in mind and several things picked out, but media, not even as old as I am, doesn't endure very long. So I have a lot of warped records and other things that have not survived very well over these years. 
uh, I, I would like also just to mention uh, part of my my younger son, David, is here with us. Uh, and he remembers many of these people from when he was young and has many stories to tell, probably funnier stories than I have to tell, but I don't want to hear those stories. Um, I have been most of my life an historian, and I'm fond of quoting some words from Henry Glassy, distinguished historian of material culture. History is not the past. History is a story about the past told in the present and designed to be useful in constructing the future. In my presentation, I will be telling a story, or a number of stories actually, overlapping, interwoven stories about the past. And I hope these will be useful to you as you work toward implementation of your exciting new grant. Grants are always stressful. I hope I don't make things worse. I will divide what I have to say into three parts. And some of these stories will be about the quest for Orthodox unity in mid-century America when I was younger. And with these stories, I'll argue that there was a sense in which liturgical singing in America in mid-century once helped to create and also express a common sense of Orthodox identity that crossed jurisdictional lines. Uh, I'll refer to this from time to time as our liturgical musical vernacular. By vernacular, I don't intend to reduce the word to whatever language we, we may happen to speak and use in our daily life. I'm using the word vernacular in much the way that cultural anthropologists do when they speak of vernacular architecture, something designed and based on local needs, on the availability of materials, and reflective of local traditions. I'll also tell stories from my own past, from high school and college through my days at St. Vladimir's Seminary, and I may even continue a little past that, since there are quite a long number of years that have passed. Uh, with these, I'll trace changes in the makeup, the nature and character of our chapel community. What do we mean when we speak of a chapel community or chapel communities? This was something that arose in the grant applications. Uh, certainly, within the seminary's worship-centered worship community, the liturgical theology taught in our classrooms came to life. We discovered the divine liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts, for example, as an evening service, something that was not commonplace. And we began to receive communion more frequently. Uh, one result in press publications was the proliferation of new musical settings for the pre-sanctified liturgy and also for communion hymns, especially. And finally, I'll try to tease out of these stories, this is the third point, eventually. I'll try to tease out of these stories something of technological and social changes that are shaping liturgical practice in ways that we may overlook simply because they are so pervasive. I think of changes in the way that words and music are transmitted changes in the way we think about time and its measurement, about pitch and notation, changes in how we experience the time and space of this world in which we live, this world in which we live now, in which change rather than no change is taken for granted. One. My story about orthodoxy in America 
about the shaping of Orthodox identity in America, and also about the quests for Orthodox unity in America as we lived through them in the last century. I'll skip debates about who went where first and why this might be important. It isn't important for my story tonight. It wouldn't help much at all. Notwithstanding small beginnings, Orthodoxy began to make its presence felt in the United States, in America generally, only with the new immigration of the last part of the 19th century, the early 20th century. Orthodoxy entered mainstream American life only in mid-century after World War II. It was then, if I may quote from Winthrop Hudson in his magisterial book on religion in America, then the Orthodox churches in America began to gain full maturity and demonstrated vitality in adjusting to the American environment through use of English, the introduction of mixed choirs and instrumental music, the installation of pews for the seating of the congregation, the development of parish organizations, and the adoption of church dinners as an important aspect of church life. That does describe middle America, mid-century. There are signs of this adjustment throughout mid-century. When, for example, in 1957, Archbishop Michael of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese became the first American president, uh, first American hierarch to take part in a presidential election. It was also in mid-20th century, on August 31st, 1963, that a remarkable event took place. And I partly owe this to my friend Matthew Namey. Uh, we, we exchange messages back and forth very often on subjects relating to orthodoxy in America. October, August 31st, 1963, in the Pittsburgh Civic Arena. Does anyone remember that before it was torn down? This was the first National Eastern Orthodox Religious Cultural Festival. There should be a picture announcing this and the program of what was sung. Uh, th this was put on by the Council of Eastern Orthodox Youth Leaders of the Americas, CIOLA for short. At the time, this was the most active and encompassing pan-Orthodox organization in America. Total attendance for the event, as estimated by Arena Mag Management, was between 11,000 and 13,000 people. You see the photo of the people in the stands. Among them were 175 Orthodox priests from Pittsburgh and elsewhere in Western Pennsylvania. On stage for the Vespers service were 10 bishops officially representing the seven American jurisdictions that had churches in the region and two visiting bishops, bishops uh, of whom one was Bishop Ignatius Hazim of Bala, who had come from Balamant and an old friend of many of us. And we should see now singing on stage seven choirs from the region. Seven choirs, each with the number capped at 150 from each choir. And there are uh, seven choirs. Let's see, here we go. Uh, for a visible expression of Orthodox in unity in America. Anyway, this was something of a high point. Can you imagine so many people at an Orthodox event? Uh, the program is someplace up here. And note the musical selections. Uh, probably all of you are familiar with some of them, maybe even many of them. Uh, I think I have up there page one. Uh, I've just put one page of each of these. You wouldn't see much. There you go. This is the outside of the festival program. Here's where the choirs were participating, but they were singing. A Greek choir, a paper Russian choir, a Romanian choir, and so on. Uh, there is, first of all, choir concert, then there is a procession of high and clergy, and so on. The repertoire 
will in part be familiar. Uh, we have, for example, uh, the uh, Archangelsky's Praise Ye the Name of the Lord, sung by the Russian choir under the direction of Father Igor Soroka. There's a Soroka family sitting behind up in the back there. Uh, note it's transposed here, uh, and it's also uh, slightly, uh, the pitch is lowered slightly. I'm not sure why. It was simply how this was being developed. Uh, the music, by the way, here and at many other places is still available uh, on the Antioch on Antiochian.org Department of Music Sacred Music Library, a, that, a treasure trove of music from the last century. This gives you an idea of what Orthodox Christians in America were singing at the time and able to sing together. Uh, the grand opening event for the occasion, the grand opening was directed by Father Vladimir Soroka. And this was a combined choir singing of a simpler setting of Praise Ye the Name of the Lord. Yeah. Toward the end of that, uh, praise ye the name of the Lord. Uh, th this has been variously uh, identified as Kiev chant, Vov Pachnechev Obichod, or in the printing that I have here as traditional. And by the time they were singing this in Philadelphia, it was traditional. For many of this, for many of us, this is as familiar as a folk song. At the Seola event, Archbishop Yakovos of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese gave the homily. For many of the attendees, this was something of a letdown. From his years in Boston, his eminence was quite familiar with Orthodox church life in America, but he was still relatively new in his position as Archbishop of America. His message was mixed. It was enthusiastic about America and Orthodox life in America, but go slow seemed to be an important element in it as well. Honor your elders, uphold your sacred traditions, maintain your old world connections. And that may have been the sentiment of many of the hierarchs there, it was not so evident, the, the sentiment of the people who were there, the singers, the clergy, who seemed to be very much part of this orthodoxy in America. And that may have been also Ciola uh, efforts to repeat the success of the Pittsburgh event were less successful, whether in terms of numbers or in terms of enthusiasm. We're putting together, tr trying to have such an event, for example, when the World's Fair took place in New York City. Uh, just too many things, too many obstacles to overcome. Still, the pursuit of Orthodox unity continued. I'll mention the Standing Conference of Orthodox Bishops in America, SCOBA, had been formed in 1960, just a few years earlier. Its study and planning committee commission began to formulate really very ambitious plans for future unity. Relations within SCOBA were strained at times, especially after the autocephaly of the OCA in 1970, but generally speaking, there was considerable cooperation among the member jurisdictions and institutions. In those days, St. Vladimir's and Holy Cross were the only two fully accredited Orthodox theological seminaries in North America. There were faculty exchanges, one professor there who was there. Uh, th there were annual meetings of the Orthodox Theological Society of America, OTSA. They alternated between campuses of the two schools. These were scheduled for the week following the end of spring semester classes so that participants could be housed in dormitory rooms, which were not very comfortable. 
and enjoyed the refectory cooking, which was excellent. Uh, and um, also, uh, conferences at one school nearly always included major participation from the other. Very close relations. And this was also the age of SCOBA-affiliated commissions, Scouting Commission, Orthodox Christian Education Commission, the Ecumenical Commission, and so on. Especially important for Helen and me was the Campus Commission, which supported the burgeoning OCF movement, Orthodox Christian Fellowship Movement, or Orthodox Christian Flunkouts, as we sometimes were called because we spent too much time working. Retreats were a regular feature of college life, and those involved a lot of work. This was before Antiochian Village, other venues were available for events of this sort. So these also were held on college campuses during weeks when dorms and dining rooms were free of their regular occupants. So rooms were generally better than those for OTSA members at St. Vladimir's or at Holy Cross. The food was worse though. A bigger problem was the setup of a temporary chapel. This required not only altar items, but also worship materials, appropriate for pan-Orthodox youth. And that meant cutting and pasting and copying and binding reams of material from multiple sources that would in some way reflect the jurisdictional diversity of attendees and at the same time would require minimal rehearsal time. Peter, you re may remember some of these events. Expressions of Orthodox unity take a lot of work, and I would say even self-abnegation. For that reason, praise ye the name of the Lord in its simplest traditional setting was one way to make the job easier. You sing the traditional music of Orthodox unity in America. What could have been another high point in this quest for Orthodox unity came in 1994, when 28 bishops from the member jurisdictions of Scoba met together at Antiochian Village near Ligonier, Pennsylvania, the largest gathering of its kind to take place in the United States, and should be. There should be a picture of Ligonier and Ligonier bishops. Uh, and the bishops issued two statements. In one, they reiter reiterated their commitment to mission and evangelism, and in their other, uh, on the church in North America, they insisted that the term diaspora no longer accurately described the situation of orthodoxy and of orthodox Christians in America. And they sketched a framework for eventual structural unity. The Ligonier statement on the church received a mixed reception in America and abroad. To the surprise of many, including all but one of the bishops who had been at Ligonier, Patriarch Bartholomew of Constantinople took the lead in denouncing the meeting as presumptuous and irregular, even though Leading up to it, he had been carefully briefed. Been, he had been carefully briefed several times about its agenda. Instead of becoming a high point in the quest for orthodox unity, Ligonier marked the end of an era. Uh, I have more to quote on the subject if you wish, but it's too sad. After a protracted struggle, Archbishop Yakovos was forced to resign in 1997 after nearly 40 years at the center of Orthodox Church life in America. In 2010, SCOBA was superseded by the Assembly of Canonical Orthodox Bishops of North and Central America, which subsequently shrank into the Assembly of Canonical Orthodox Bishops of the United States of America, as other Episcopal regions were spun off. Uh, as you know, the Assembly of Bishops does meet annually. There are photo ops to prove it. Uh, its, its, bureauc its bureaucracy has assumed nominal responsibility for the various dialogues, ministries, and for, for that were formerly under SCOBA. I think it fair to say, and I think it would be hard for anyone to argue this, 
uh, that the assembly of bishops has done very little to actualize or even advocate, advocate for the structural unity of orthodoxy in America. But the ghost of unity still haunts us. By the closing years of the 20th century, a major era in the quest for unity had come to an end, and with it, its musical expression. If I want to give a symbolic date for this, and a place for this, I would choose Tarpon Springs, Florida on the Feast of Epiphany, January 6, 1997. Tarpon Springs has an interesting history, and I love Tarpon Springs in that area of Florida very much. Um, the Greek community there uh, is old. It began diving for sponges in the late 19th century. The architecture of its church is remarkable as well. It's been described as Neo-Byzantine. It also has strong Caribbean elements combined. An interesting expression of Orthodox in America architecture, anyway. Uh, and if we could turn to the next page. I think you know that the annual Epiphany Blessing of Bayou Bay and the Die for the Cross is world famous. The parish uh, for many years had as its chief cantor, choir director, for many years, George Anastasiou, uh, who went on to publish a very popular Greek Byzantine liturgical hymnal for parish use in America. Uh, its most recent re reprinting, I think, was in the 1960s still. Uh, here he is, and this is a tape from the Works Progress Administration recording uh, program in the 19th, late 1930s. Uh, here he is singing from Epiphany in those days, uh, back in the late 1930s. His wife, Effie, uh, was the church organist and also a very fine musician in her own right. Play a little bit of, of Anastasiu. Uh, he, um, keep in mind, this is recorded. <laughs> the idea this is for any professional recording and it's much degenerated it's in library of congress you can load you can find this. Uh, and um keep in mind uh, also elsewhere let's let me put it this way it's easy to understand even with this recording why tarpon springs is proud of its musical heritage. It goes back a long way. And also in those WPA recordings, you could hear Effie uh, singing Miser Lou, and which is an earlier, earlier rendition than we're accustomed to dancing to, as we did in the days when here at St. Vladimir Seminary, we had folk dancing in uh, the auditorium of the education building. Uh, that was orthodoxy in America in the last century. This was Tarpon Springs as it was, but on Epiphany 1997, the expression of vernacular American Orthodox Church singing that Anastasiu had embodied in his own way and that he had championed for many decades was challenged quite dramatically by a new Archbishop of America, Spiridon. The Archbishop was a native son of Tarpon Springs. He had played on the local football team. He had died for the cross at Epiphany. But he spent most of his professional life as an Orthodox churchman abroad in the service of the Ecumenical Patriarchate. He was famous for proclaiming his unconditional obedience to the Ecumenical throne. 
and that didn't last. But after a succession of crises that I don't have to go into, he was eventually removed from his position as Archbishop of America in 1999. Uh, I mention only that when he went to Tarpon Springs for the blessing of the waters, the bayou, the choir, the kind of choir that you had seen earlier, was shoved out and replaced exclusively by male cantors. That didn't go over too well for public relations, and I think it might explain why he was not very popular, whether there or other places in America. Uh, and I think that I don't have to go into all the, the sequel of his deposition, uh, his promotion actually to a see that uh, has no church and no people, but a promotion in Asia Minor so he lives in Portugal. Uh, the, I would only say that the ensuing changes reflect the complex but ever closer ties between Orthodox jurisdictions in America and their mother churches in the old world and the concurrent decline in cooperative endeavors here in the Americas. This shift, I would argue, significantly dampened enthusiasm for what I have called vernacular American Orthodox church singing and music. The new mantra, and I hope this will not sound offensive, the new mantra becomes authenticity. Authenticity, as this came to be defined in Constantinople in the 19th century, as a number of changes were made or a number of a renaissance of Byzantine music in the 19th century. And here I will just pause for a half second to look at some notes. Consider the 19th century, changes in the 19th century, the increase of populations, how different the world of modernity was from traditional cultures in which Orthodox and almost everyone had lived. I offer two T's to illustrate in the 19th century, tuning and timing. Tuning uh, to A440, standardization of tuning, standardization of timing and the invention of the metronome to keep the beat. This is the kind of change that is going on elsewhere. Not always identical results, but the same preoccupation. Uh, another thing transpiring in those days, I'll mention it later, acoustic management. Uh, Sanders Theater in Cambridge, Massachusetts is in some ways famous. It's famous for its acoustics. So I was suggesting it's also famous because uh, of the unit of measurement for acoustical absorption. The physics department did experiments. Why are the acoustics of Sanders Theater so marvelous? They experimented with testing for the thousand and some seats to see and to compare the absorption. And so to this day, the Sabine unit uh, of sound absorption is the standard for determination. Everything becomes very scientific in the 19th century, or it tries to be very scientific. And of course, uh, there is time, time management, time tables, time, be time is money, time becomes an issue. Uh, consider the clock the clock tower of Domabache Palace. The clock that was on St. Constantine Church, St. Constantine Helen Church in Pera. Uh, clocks, what time is it? O'clock, like eight o'clock and something of the clock, clock time, as opposed to time in which Months, uh, which 
days in which hours in the winter are longer than they are in the summer. Instead of time calculated in that way, it is time with a 24 hour day with equal days. Another development in the 19th century and in the Ottoman Empire as well. There are lots of articles on the subject. There was, of course, a reaction against this, and I will just mention two examples. Uh, I think you're all familiar with Munch's The Scream, expressing the anxiety of mo modernity. You're familiar with that famous scene from Buster Keaton, uh, hanging from a clock face above a busy skyscraper. It slowly falls backwards. Or Salvador Dali with persistence of memory, melting clocks and timepieces. This was, these were modern preconceptions. This was the preoccupation of people in the 19th century and as it moves into the 20th century causes us horror. Don't let these modern preconceptions determine your criteria for method uh, for the way that things should be now. And uh, I'll return. I'll get off that subject and move on. Anyway, I think that there were big changes in the 20th century. I'll move very quickly through my own story, story number two. It begins in Brainerd, Minnesota, a county seat in north central Minnesota, a town very much like Garrison Keeler's Lake Wobegon, as featured on NPR's Prairie Home Companion. Peter remembers that very well. Uh, Brainerd's population. Brainerd's population was roughly a third Catholic, a third Lutheran, a third other, the others being mainline Protestants. As historians of religion point out, mid-century Amer America was the high point for formal religious adherence in North America, in the United States. In a town like mine, interest in religious issues wasn't weird. It was a town in which interreligious contact was part of everyday life. It was almost inevitable in a town like mine. Sacred music was widely heard throughout the area. Arranger and conductor F. Malius Christensen of St. Olaf College was something of a celebrity. Uh, English language versions of classic Russian Orthodox choral composition uh, were widely available and widely sung. My wife sang creation is created in the midst of the earth, for example, when she was in high school. In, the do in those days, the upper Midwest was also noteworthy for its contributions to liturgy and liturgical arts. The right spot. Uh, this is just after I got my driver's license. and I could drive 60 miles to St. John's Abbey, a large Benedictine house just 60 miles from home. I drove there fairly often after I got my driver's license. Marcel Breuer's new Abbey Church mid-century brutalist masterpiece had just recently been completed. Also impressive was the Abbey's, mon the monastery's abbot, Godfrey Diekmann, who was a pioneer in the modern liturgical movement. In America, he was the one who got it off the ground. He was well acquainted with the work of pioneers in Europe, and not only Catholics, but also Orthodox at St. Sergius in Paris. He was a person who had considerable Im impact on my life at that time. I was a, sort of a high school student, but monasteries are relaxed places. A person who had greater impact in those years was Father Anthony Coniaris of Life and Life Publications. You may remember Father Anthony Coniaris. Uh, he was nearly new as a priest in St. Mary's Greek Orthodox Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. 
The church itself is a really beautiful expression of the aesthetic of mid-century orthodoxy in America. And Father Anthony was unusual among Orthodox clergy that I met in those days because he didn't think it odd that someone might want to read a book in English about Orthodoxy. He generously loaned me books, not just from the church library, but from his personal library. And when I was writing a term paper in 10th grade or so on the Orthodox Church or something related to it, he very helpful, he offered many helpful suggestions. This was growing up in the Midwest. I went off to college and I had quite a few Orthodox friends. One was Olga Verhovskoy, the second of Prof's daughters. Serge Schmemann was a class below me in college. One of my roommates, Boris Nikolov, was the multi-talented son of a Macedonian Bulgarian Orthodox priest in Detroit. He organized an amazing Byzantine Russian liturgical choir that sang concerts in Harvard's Sanders Theater, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, this should be someplace here, should be the program for the concert, and this is the inside of that. A wonderful place to sit. And we, unfortunately, the recording is really terribly warped at this point, and it probably wasn't too good in the first place. Uh, but everyone had a great time. Uh, and the concert suggestions are about what you would expect in the mid-century. Lots of Russian standards. Vedil, uh, open to be the doors of repentance. Dektaryov, uh, Wolf of thy mystical supper. Goncharov, before thy cross. The usuals. Uh, and Byzantine selections were limited. They were harmonized arrangements of Byzantine chant, most often by Frank Desby, an excellent musician, Los Angeles based. And almost all the people on the Byzantine side that I'm mentioning were professional musicians, well trained with advanced degrees in music. Um, the whole point of showing this, uh, to say a little more about, for example, not much authenticity, I would say. Smolensky Great Litany was a collection of beautiful tenor arias for the deacon's part, which is rather weird. Uh, the soprano soloist for Rachmaninoff's We Praise Thee was a soprano, a woman rather than a boy, as authenticity would have required for the tibia poem. Uh, with the right acoustics, though, even an amateur choir can sound quite magnificent with not very much rehearsal and everyone had a great time, uh, and uh, it encouraged lots of people to become involved in church music and to appreciate it. While I was in college, I visited St. Vladimir's from time to time. I was formally, re formally received into the Orthodox Church here in the old chapel in 1964. After college, I spent a year abroad on a fellowship for study and travel it was a very flexible scholarship or fellowship, not very generous in terms of money, but the only requirement was that I not plan to do something during that year that I was going to do in graduate school. I based myself in Madrid, which was cheap at the time, and this allowed me to travel all around the Mediterranean, Morocco, across North Africa, Egypt, uh, the, I traveled inexpensively by sleeping on, during the night on the bus to save on a room. Uh, I had many interesting experiences. This was before the 1967 war. I was in the old city of Jerusalem for old calendar Christmas, at, in Bethlehem rather. Uh, I. Constantinople, on the way back, called on Patriarch Athenagoras, who was wonderfully hospitable. Considering I had arrived in th at the Fenar with my shoes caked with mud, because I'd walked all the way from near the Blue Mosque where I was staying all the way to the Fenar. That's a long walk. Uh, I also went to Mount Athos and saw many changes along the way, 
and I was in Athens just a week or two weeks before the coup of the colonels. I'm glad I was there when I was there and not a few weeks later. Uh, after that year abroad, I returned to the United States for graduate school, religious studies department at Yale. My friend Olga, at this point, Olga Dunlop. Some of you may know John Dunlop, uh, Olga's late husband, in his fine book on Star Ambrosi. Olga was eager to introduce me to Helen, her best friend from college. Helen, at that point, uh, I had not met, even though we had been at many events together at St. Vladimir's, but you didn't speak to people to whom you weren't introduced, and I was rather shy, and so was she. Uh, but Olga said, there's this wonderful girl we want you to meet, my best friend from college, a nice Orthodox girl, wonderful cook, makes all her own clothes. Her mother made a good deal of the clothes. I do all the cooking in the household at this point. Uh, but she is a wonderful girl, a wonderful woman. And we've been married for over 50 wonderful years. At the time we met, Helen was a major uh, was in the Master of Music program at Yale in performance as a soprano, singing with the Capella Cordina, a group that you know, early music, Akagam, Dufay, and so on. And, but she wrote her final paper, an extended paper under Milos Velimirovich on the communion hymn Gebsa Sekeidete in 14th and 15th century Akulusia manuscripts that I think we still have the microfilms that she got from the National Library in Athens in our library, uh, and among her courses, uh, she did a little introduction to Byzantine notation and transcription of notation. Uh, she also uh, taught voice from time to time on the side. Some of you may know now Bishop John Abdullah. He had been a terrible singer. He took voice lessons from her, and even as nearly adult, uh, he became a very good singer. It can happen. The, during these years, graduate school with the uh, encouragement of Yaroslav Pelikan, one of my professors, I took as many courses as possible at St. Vladimir's with Father John Meyendorf. And since I was making the trip anyway, I took whatever other courses were being offered on the day that he was teaching. Uh, my favorite was with Professor Arseniev. I also did some church Slavonic, which was not as pleasant. Uh, Litvinovich, remember him, no, Peter, you are, you're too young. Uh, and then uh, Helen, meanwhile, made the trip with me. She took Russian with Miss Chet, Miss Chet Virikova, professors sister-in-law, and she met with Dave in the afternoon to discuss the world of Eastern chant. After Yale, our next stop was Berkeley, California, then Dumbarton Oaks in Washington, DC. Wherever we happened to be, Helen and I were involved in OCF activities. And that meant that she organized and directed choirs and I helped organize music. And then in fall 1973, I got a job at St. Vladimir's Seminary. And like most other faculty, we had very little money. I like to say that I lived biblically by the sweat of my frau. I know, bad pun. In any case, Helen taught music at Hackley School in Terrytown, part-time liturgical music here at SVS to keep us afloat. Uh, the, those who don't mind a life of genteel poverty have come to the right place. The New York metro area is just wonderful. We thrived, so did our kids, and so they do so ever since. Shortly before my first visit to the seminary, uh, the seminary, shortly before my first visit, the seminary had relocated from New York and settled in Crestwood. At the time, and here I get into some differences of present day, the student body consisted almost, almost exclusively of single young males, roughly half at the theological level and half at the collegiate level, the pre 
fee level, college level, free logical, as Gregory Kesich called them. This meant that the students were between 17 or 18 years old and uh, their early 20, into their 20s. We had annually uh, a C pre C football game. Uh, Dave Drillick and I sometimes, we often refereed it. The most often call was for unnecessary language. Uh, Father Schmemann also volunteered to referee, saying that since I know nothing about the game at all, I can be perfectly impartial. The both groups, the thieves and pre thieves spent the academic year in college style on campus accommodations on weekends most dispersed to parish assignments. During the winter break, summer vacation, uh, both of them, most of the students went home, whoever that might be. And during most of the summers, most of the faculty left town also. Uh, some home parishes of our students were on the new calendar, some on the old calendar, as was a seminary for many years. So the winter break stretched from shortly before new calendar Christmas through old calendar theophany. And during this period, some musical outreach was beginning. Dave has spoken about this before, and you've read more on the subject. From 1962 onward, the select students comprised the seminary octets that toured the country. Meanwhile, faculty members who hadn't left Crestwood for summer attended local Orthodox parishes. For some of us, the Verhofskois, Helen and I, uh, we attended Holy Trinity Greek Orthodox Church in New Rochelle, where Alex de Morris, teacher of Greek at the seminary, factotum at the seminary, he cooked, he did almost everything, managed the bookstore. He was also the English language secretary for Archbishop Yakovos. Uh, he directed the choir there. We sang in the choir there. We were happy singing in the choir there. During the winter break, chapel singing was left to a small but musical pickup on ensemble. Parts shifted about, much depended on who was singing that Sunday, that weekend. Matushka Juliana Schmemann played a major role in all this. She could sing almost any part. One plus, I just put in one plus because I don't know that there are too many more. One plus of Lvov Bakhmetyev Obikod is that shifting parts around is very easy to do. You see, you could have any combination of them. It just requires deciding you do this and you do that. But during those years, the seminary was changing rapidly. Within five years, enrollment had more than doubled. Programs accepted not only candidates for the priesthood, but also men and women from the United States and abroad who sought to serve the church in other capacities. New programs included a special track in liturgical music throughout the year a one-week Summer Institute of Liturgical Music and Pastoral Practice. Important in all these endeavors was Father Sir Sergei Glagolev. And there you have one of the sort of most compact ways of reproducing his most popular and most easily switched around uh, 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 communion verse, the righteous shall be an everlasting remembrance. You can sing this with almost any combination of parts in any way and switching parts and choirs or uh, however you wish to do it, but with verses or not. Father Sergei could take a simple catchy melody and rhythmic motif and develop it, expand it, layer it. Uh, his impact on our seminary music programs can be seen in the names of contributors to our music publications. And also it can be felt in Orthodox parishes across this continent and beyond in Japan, Finland, Europe. By the mid 1970s, women comprised roughly 15% of the student body. The number of married students with wives and children also increased. The seminary outgrew the old chapel 1983, the present chapel was completed. 
but a male choir still went out to regional parishes for a dozen or more Sundays of the academic year. Antiochian students went to their parish assignments on Sundays. So for the Sunday divine liturgy, the seminary depended on a, a mixed choir consisting of remaining students, faculty families, seminary friends in the area. That was the composition of our chapel community. The chapel community continued to evolve and it still continues to evolve. We have some of those people here tonight. Uh, Betty Malone, our star soprano. I almost put in a picture of you with David when he was a baby because she's my son's godmother. Uh, Ted Basil, another. Uh, those were wonderful times, for, I, for certainly for me. I mention all this because what does it we mean when we speak of chapel community? This is not the kind of parish that you might imagine from popularizing presentations of St. Ignatius of Antioch. It's not this, that's not this kind of place. Uh, certainly, this is something that you will be considering for quite a long time. What is the nature of community here at St. Vladimir's Seminary? And as the composition of the seminary, the community evolved, so did the repertoire of chapel music. And the content of our music publications, uh, I don't have to speak much more about their strengths, their weaknesses, what they achieved didn't pan out as we expected. We'll talk about that, I suppose. I'll mention only the divine liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts. Dave edited uh, the first edition in 1973, as he noted in his introduction to the expanded 1990 edition. When the first edition of this book appeared, the divine liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts was still one of the hidden treasures of Orthodox Lenten worship. Much has changed since then, especially thanks to the teaching and writing of Father Alexander Schmemann, late Dean of St. Vladimir Seminary, uh, and others devoted to the renewal of liturgical life in our church. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, certainly concern for liturgical renewal lay at the heart of what we were trying to do at St. Vladimir's Seminary, in our classrooms as well as in our chapel. Restoration of the Divine Liturgy of the Presanctified Gifts as an evening service was part of this, and really quite something new for many people. And uh, so also a new emphasis of communion, communion of the faithful during the Divine Liturgy, something almost unheard of earlier. Uh, a feature of our publications, uh, its seminary publications and student endeavors was providing weekday and festal communion hymns with their appropriate psalm verses, which we've got a lot now. Many of them composed and arranged by aspiring young church musicians who had passed through one or another seminary program. I'll only just mention briefly pastoral changes relating to confession and communion. When Helen and I were helping out in New, New Haven, uh, when we were living in New Haven, we spent a good deal of time in New Britain, Connecticut. Father Paul Laser was the pastor there. His choir director, the old school type, had quit at the beginning of Lent. So Helen and I took over as best we could, commuting from New Haven or staying in the back rooms of the rectory. Uh, and I would spend Saturday afternoons trying to make Stihira texts more singable because they weren't all very singable at all. And also uh, banging out our stencils on a mimeograph machine in time for Vespers that evening. For Vespers, we had a small group of singers. For Matins, Helen and I were often the only ones. Uh, and we used the Orthros volume produced by Michael Hilko Michael Hilko, Ukrainian in background, doing much of his work for the Antiochian Archdiocese, which was the most English-speaking diocese in the North America at the time. Uh, for the Divine Liturgy, there were a lot of people in the choir loft, because we were in choir lofts in those days. 
Helen and I sang in the, with the choir in the balcony. She was the tone giver because the oldest female inhabitant was the official director. And I would sing in the tenor section. One day, toward the end of Lent, on Sunday, one of my fellow tenors leaned over the railing to see why things were moving so slowly for communion. There must be a lot of sinners, he said rather loudly. Uh, his reaction suggests how closely reception of communion in Orthodox parishes had come to be linked and effectively uh, to confession and effectively limited to three or four particularly solemn seasons of the church year. These are things that have changed over half a century or maybe a little more than half a century. That they've changed is I think in large part because the seminary at the seminary issues of this sort were taken seriously. Uh, not uh, th this was true throughout the curriculum in patristics, liturgy, pastoral theology, even church history. I was speaking of the subject with with you of my church on ortho my course on orthodoxy in America. Uh, we I encouraged oral history projects. Elena Silk would give an introductory talk on the mechanics of doing oral history. And she also spoke on the subject of going to confession when she was a little girl, clutching a quarter in her hand. And as she was in line to go to confession, there was a feeding vent underneath her. She was petrified that she was going to drop that quarter. Uh, it's terrifying to be in a situation of that sort. And of course, the quarter was for a candle and Father Tom, Father Paul rather, explained uh, one of his first experiences in a new parish. A lot of candles had piled up, of people who had bought candles and put the candles down. Uh, he proceeded to light the candles and the sacristan said, what are you doing? Are you crazy? Because you're supposed to convert the candles back into cash. Uh, because candles in the Orthodox Church, and they still are fungible, they are a form of currency. And they are convertible. Uh, and the expectation is that the Trebi, and this is the true in Greek Orthodox churches too, uh, you're encouraged to buy a candle. Uh, and the candles, as I said, can be converted back into cash. Uh, this was what paid the sacristan. This was what paid the priest, because this was one of the perks or one of the things that allowed you to survive. This is no longer the case, I hope. Uh, but that was that, that was how things were in mid-century. Uh, certainly, uh, I enjoyed having Father Tom, Father Paul. They told ter terrific stories in their classes and in mine. This was grainy history. This was uh, stuff in, that they mentioned that relatively few students were familiar with firsthand, but that would impinge on their work as priests, life after seminary. Uh, certainly, Father Paul, Dave, Father Tom, uh, Elena, these were people with considerable experience with what I've been calling vernacular American orthodoxy. And uh, I'm not sure we have that same sensitivity at this point to the past that we had a, a real way of knowing about the past. For us, this was growing up. For people now, it is something new, and some cases rather exotic. Uh, I'm told I should say a little bit about what Helen and I have been doing since retirement, and I will quit after that point rather than getting on to point three. Uh, what is Helen doing? She is teaching landscape architecture after getting a new degree at the University of Arizona and taking students on field trips when COVID isn't flourishing, isn't thriving. Uh, I am an Orthodox priest. I serve almost equal time in churches 
of the Antiochian Archdiocese, the Serbian Eastern American, Western American Diocese, the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, and from time to time in OCA churches. Uh, did I mention Greek Orthodox? Because I'm in those two. Uh, this usually isn't much of a problem unless the planes are not working right or unless I'm having car trouble. Uh, in my little church in Bisbee, Arizona, uh, the choir does not sing in a loft, it sings down front. I have uh, books that I put out that are aimed at including those attending services in the singing, particularly at during the Eucharistic canon from let us lift up our hearts, we lift them up unto the Lord and so on. They are very good, all of them with responses. It is slightly simplified version of Makranitz, Serbian composer. Uh, I do the music all the time for it. And I would say we um, the music could be described as improvised heterophony because not all of them sing particularly well. So you have to plan what you are doing and sometimes rewrite music so that you can accommodate who is going to be there. Tone three, the Greek chant, you know how it begins with a rising minor third. We have a soprano who is ordinarily pretty good, but she cannot sing that interval. So I begin on the tonic. Uh, and this is life in America now as I know it. I'm perfectly happy serving in parishes of many jurisdictions. Uh, and uh, certainly, I think that in the interplay of change and continuity in church life, as I've experienced it over the decades, change is possible, but you know how reluctant, how allergic to change, resistant to change, Orthodox can be. Even something very simple, like the wording of the creed, who spake by the prophets. Well, now everybody really has changed it to who spoke by the prophets. But why did they change it? I hear from people. You know, that was before I was born. Long time ago. Uh, very often we are like, joke, how many orthodox does it take to change a light bulb? We don't change. But misplaced love for tradition can lead to an unhealthy traditionalism. Church history offers many examples of this. New communication technologies, internet chat rooms, may even be more effective at spreading traditionalism than word of mouth was in the days of Avaku or other sectarians. Today, we have difficulty meeting tradition together untethered by history, because what we're trying to do so often is seize on tradition that is floating out there somewhere. The tradition, as I've experienced it, was that with Father Paul, with Father Tom, Dave, Ted even, and your aunt back in Tucson, Arizona, Zena, uh, this is the kind of orthodoxy that I hope is not dying out because it's an orthodoxy that values the past, not just as a museum, uh, but as a life experience, a formative experience, and in one in which they are happy also to see their children take part. But thank you. I will close with that without my point three but I hope we'll have more opportunities for discussion. Thank you so much, Father John. And um, you really have shared with us your life experience. And I think that's something we this gathering here values uh, very much and 
Um, are there any questions? We've got about so 15 minutes or so for, for questions. And we'll then please just uh, use the microphone. Mm -hmm. I'll just say that for me, since Betty is here, um, a particularly memorable experience here at St. Vladimir's is the singing of thy resurrection. And every single younger child would know when it was time for Betty to sing because this is a very solemn, slow-moving processional that invites an opportunity for us to think about something maybe a little bit more grand or higher above us plodding along, friends not singing very well. Um, and so I guess um, I have my greatest hits. Um, I, you experience them high and low. I'm wondering if you could share some of your greatest hits of Orthodox singing in the time that you were here at St. Vladimir's. Thank you. Well, seeing the resurrection of Christ our Savior, the clergy began. Oh, I'm sorry. The clergy, especially if it was Father John and Father Alexander, began in two different keys. But the clergy would begin singing Thy Resurrection, O Christ our Savior, and then men's choir would join in, and then it was mixed, and Betty would get all the high notes. Uh, and uh, it was quite magnificent. Uh, the, there are also other funny things that happen. Uh, the altar boys had a knack. I don't know if you still have Sapivka after communion. You do. Uh, because the kids, the altar boys, the basil kids, the drillic kids, my kids, other seminary kids knew a great deal of what went on in the sacristy. Uh, and they would stack the little cups for Zapivka in the appropriate cabinet, but leaning against the door so that the sacristan who opened that cabinet the next day would have them all tumble out on the floor and make a great deal of noise. And <laughs> well, there, <laughs> and where there was a sacristan who, uh, the, the, the kids were altar boys and they noticed bees coming in and out from the bell that's by the side of the sacristy. Uh, and so they went in and told the sacristan, he said, what should we do guys? And they, Let's smoke them out. So they were out there with a censer trying to smoke out the bees and everybody in the church, in the choir at least, were on that side, were watching the kids trying to smoke out the bees from the, from the bell. Uh, all of this, I'm sure they remember better than many other things. Uh, I know they had a lot of fun. And they also learned quite a lot. Uh, for example, almost all of them could sing the Paschals to hear, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered in the arrangement that Matushka, Helen Benningson and I did, a Pskov tradition that she and father had picked up in Pskov, uh, they could sing that just beautifully and in parts. Uh, this was kids, grade school, uh, participation in church life and in singing in church, I think is very important. And also the possibility of serving even if they, Altar boys can serve, it can cause some problems, some difficulties from time to time. Ted, you have a. Yeah, so I just want to say a few things about Father John. Um, can you hear me? Um, that besides his, besides the study of church history and his academic pursuits and 
um, all, the, all the teaching and uh, influences left on students through, the, through these generations. Uh, I don't, we can't underscore his contribution to Orthodox music. And he's, he's you know, very humble about this, but because of his background, his, his work in languages, uh, his love for music and adaption, he was instrumental, in, so instrumental with obviously other colleagues involved. And this wasn't what he was necessarily trained in, but he did it because of his love and his dedication to see some kind of reality come true in the singing of music in all these different forms and traditions. So, uh, and I you can go just on and on with all the stuff that he's done. I remember through the years in the DRE, uh, Department of Religious Education. So, you know, we just owe him a tremendous sense of gratitude for all of his contributions in that area. Thank you. We did have we did have some grand ideas. Basically, coordination, we didn't, I didn't get to that. Coordination of the DRE pamphlets with the texts for parishioners to follow all the services of Holy Week and many others. Were so instrumental. And the music, so that there was a coordination of them. Uh, I remember working on the Stahira for the bridegroom services of Holy Week and the services of Holy Week, generally speaking, uh, of working on the translations, working them over, because it really requires a recomposition. You have to know the music very well, and you have to be able to express the words in a comprehensible way. You don't want a recessive accent at the end of a line. You don't want an awkward cesura. You want a certain sense of rhythm and flow to it. Uh, you want a similar structure of lines. And uh, this is basically something that you really have to recompose the text as well as the music, uh, reorganize the text in various ways. Peter. So, no, uh, just let me finish. So I'm sorry, said, Ted. There you go, what he just explained, what, what, what he did for generations and for years, uh, for untold hours and a lot of labor. And my last point here is I'm really thrilled to have you back and to hear you sharing all this because uh, these are gener this generation now needs to hear this. Uh, you know, it's not ex nihilo. We, we came from something and we're going somewhere. And you've really uh, shared with us a tremendous sense of history and future. Don't be afraid of recomposing things. Not, not, not the notes so much, but just simply work over the text. Really learn and assimilate the text. Uh, and uh, I remember the methodology for this initially was that I was working on Stihira, then Father John Meyendorf would go over it to make sure that the Greek, that it, that it was accurate. Uh, and then I would point out various things. And this was before the services that which we were going to test market the texts of Stihira for the bridegroom services in the course of Holy, of, of, um, Holy Week. Uh, the, you really have to get be very fully involved in the music that you're doing, that you're working on. And uh, another question, Ted. Thank you very much. I, I have this, I have stories about Ted too. <laughs> <laughs> Ted, Ted was always very gullible. I remember. I won't tell all of the Ted gullibility stories, but I was telling him this building was just getting completed, and. Uh, I was telling him that we needed voice activated Braille now because there were new regulations and he was going along with it. Ask him to tell you about going with Dave to pick up books in Newark. Um, one quick comment and then a, a, a quick question. Uh, the comment is uh, just by, by chance. I, I don't conduct a choir here often anymore, but this I conducted this past Sunday and we sang four of your compositions. Um, that's one comment. Additional comment related to that, the Green Liturgy book, uh, which many today, we were calling it like OCA music. I think it's almost synonymous with the music that's come out of St. Vladimir's Seminary Press. But a lot of people today were calling this Slavic music. And I don't think you composed Slavic music. I also noticed that in the green book, there is Serbian chant, there's Romanian chant. 
there is Greek chant harmonized. Um, so that's just a, a quick comment that OCA music is not necessarily Slavic music. Uh, did you want to, you seem to the, want maybe say something about that? Some things are kind of, the, the I didn't know I had written that much. Yeah. Uh, they, the sang only uh, in, in, sang, uh, in uh, Tucson, yeah. it, uh, our yeah. choir at Holy Resurrection sings, uh, What Shall I Render to the Lord? Right. That is sung quite often. Uh, I have other things that have been sung. Just I was wondering whether I should call this vernacular music <laughs> that I've been involved in, and that many of us were involved in, or utility music. Because in a way, it's utility music. You write it not just for one occasion, not for propaganda purposes, the way that that uh, you might think of with German uh, utility music uh, for a big event. I only wrote one thing for a big event. I don't know that it's been performed more than once, but it was for my older son's marriage. Uh, it was a new setting of uh, Come to Me from Lebanon, and we had coming, in addition to Betty, in addition to Dave, many great singers, but a really outstanding baritone. So this was written for a baritone soloist. You know, uh, you have to be able to do that kind of thing if you've got someone talented. Usually, though, things that I do now are for one voice or two voices, or at most three, for my little group in Bisbee. If I could just ask that question, because it's so relevant to our if meeting. If you get a word in it twice, Peter. Yeah. I mean, following on what, what Ted said totally accurately about your, your influence on um, the church music scene, um, and as uh, Alexander, when he was introducing you, pointed out that you, uh, with Dave, and also in some cases with Helen, um, published, edited, and published the church music volumes. Um, can you succinctly speak to three or four of the priorities or criteria uh, that guided your work? Uh, choosing repertoire, uh, setting in the English language, uh, and all of those choices that had to be made and that have really stood the test of time. What, what, what was guiding you as you together were making those choices? Well, we wanted to be inclusive. The question is, were we colonizing? One of the difficulties, and this is something I didn't get to because I didn't get to part three, uh, but while orthodoxy had a certain vernacular shape in the 20th century, it has increasingly lost that because of closer and closer connections over abroad and less and less cohesion here. Uh, and we're much more sensitive to a lot of issues now than we once were. If I were recomposing things again, I would use different pronouns and I would be much more sensitive to questions that were barely on the horizon then. It includes includes questions of gender. Uh, for example, this was already arising when Helen was directing the choir at times on a, let's say on a Sunday. There was one student, there's there, the word mankind is generic. It means humankind. The word mankind with the accent on the first syllable refers to male as, a, as distinct from female. There was one seminarian, particularly obnoxious, whenever he would direct or sing, would loudly say, mankind, rather than mankind. Uh, you run into situations like that, and it's a little exasperating. Like another student who was not very into cooper cooperation with others, when he was supposed to be planning uh, a project with one other person, simply turned his chair around and refused to interact with anyone. Uh, students are a mixed lot. And um, Paul Meyendorf had funny stories about that. Uh, can you imagine asking 
as an ID, uh, Barberini, whatever it is, codex. And some students know how to identify that very well as a late 8th century unsealed manuscript, oldest of the epilogian that you, that you can get. Uh, and uh, some of the students did very well with it, others not so as well. Uh, one complained that something so insignificant should be asked, and how is this going to help me, help me in my pastoral ministry? Uh, you get all kinds of attitudes, get used to it. Uh, I think that it's important that students be have some exposure to history of liturgy, to texts. Uh, it would be good also uh, to have some experience with poetry in whatever language and literature. Father Alexander Schmemann is terrific at that. Uh, be a well-read person. Uh, being pastoral will not get any harder if you are well-read and show an interest in what other people may possibly be interested in. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, Peter, I keep interrupting you and everybody else. I have very little chance to talk. It's, it, it's in Bisbee, even, my back is to the congregation much of the time. It's only with sermons do I get long. So we have one, one final question, I think, before we head to, uh, off to our reception. Thank you, Father John, for your, for your beautiful story of the history of uh, Orthodox music here and your involvement in it in the United States and North America generally. Um, as someone from a younger generation, um, my own experience coming into the church was in an OCA parish in British Columbia where there was more Byzantine music than any other tradition. Mm -hmm. And then I came to another one in California and that was reversed. Um, that's a part of a preface to a question, which is in your title, you have identity, authenticity, and fidelity. I don't know if fidelity was your third point, but authenticity seemed to be used in kind of a negative way associated with this fragmentation, as maybe we would describe it, toward a closer relationship with the patriarchates and so forth. Is your vision of what the OCA should do is to have kind of equal parts of music from each tradition? At some level, this is kind of maybe begging some of what Peter was trying to get at, which is, what is the OC, what is the OCA's vision for a, a, a truly vernacular fulfillment of Orthodox music, as you see it, as you see it? Um, I, I have very little influence on the OCA in general, because the OCA, there are many parishes, and there are many parishes very different one from another to prescribe something for one would be, I think, a disaster without considering maybe. But this is not only in the OCA, the differences in liturgical practice. Uh, Holy Resurrection in Tucson is two miles from my house. I'm there if I'm not somewhere else, and I serve perfectly happily there. The serving style, almost everything about it is different from another Antiochian Orthodox archparish that I also substitute in and know pretty well. Uh, there are, ju just be familiar with, you're going to run into different things. Pay attention to why people might be attached to them, why they might be allergic to something else. And don't invent a world, don't imagine a world that doesn't exist anymore if it ever did. The creations of Orthodox cultures and so on, you, uh, you were doing a wonderful job of describing the problems. Uh, we try to identify with times, cultures, societies that no longer exist, except in our imaginations in many cases. Try to live in the real world. And the real world could have a half dozen people and a soprano who can't sing a minor third, or others will have a beautiful, beautiful choir. Uh, I, that doesn't answer your question, I don't suppose, but your, your question, I'm sorry, Father. 
Well, actually, though, that, that is a question that we, as, as Father John just noted, that has been uh, key to our discussions throughout the colloquium, issues of, of authenticity and uh, perceptions of them and of fidelity to an or text or an imaginary one and so on. So um, we're hoping that uh, some of the talks from the other parts of the seminar, they, they're being recorded and we hope to make uh, those selectively available as well. So we, so in the meantime, I'd just like to thank you so much again, Father John, for helping us bring the conversation of the colloquium forward and also for everything you've shared with this audience. Thank you.